Hey folks, your friendly neighborhood Layman Pascal here with the second episode of the Integral Stages new series devoted to discussions about integral psychology. What distinguishes it? What does it encompass? Where did it come from? Where is it going? And what other approaches are analogous to it? Our guest today joined us on the author series to discuss his book on trauma, The Monster's Journey, and he's back to get more general and more in-depth about integrative therapy. It's my old boss from the construction site, Mark the Foreman. Hey, Mark. Hi, <laughs> Layman. Pleasure. I apologize. <laughs> pleasure to be here. Total pleasure. So the book Integral Psychology is, is debatably my favorite Wilbur book. Mm-hmm. And uh, I really liked, uh, I really like understanding the early moves he was making around spectrum of consciousness in terms of trying to put the schools of therapy together. There's only been a couple of guys who've tried to make that move. What's your, I mean, what's your first and general take on what integral psychology is? What makes it different than anything else? I would say Ken really is, I believe, the most insightful theorist of what we in integral would call the left-hand quadrants. And he's got some gifts in the lower left for describing the the nature of changing cultures. But I would say his gifts in the upper left uh, are maybe his, his greatest strengths. So his ability to take a step back from the basic theories of psychotherapy and then draw connections Um, may well be his greatest contribution in a lot of ways, specifically when we're talking about a a sort of mid-level theory. So Ken does a lot of high-level theorizing, meta-theorizing, which I think is also often, you know, groundbreaking still to to this day. But he does also venture into a more mid-level theorizing where he looks at a field and sort of said, okay, here's some of the constituent camps of this field. How can they relate to one another? And I think the work that he did in integral psychology and maybe even more in transformations of consciousness, which was sort of the earlier work in which he most tackled uh, with high specificity the therapeutic schools and how they relate. I I just think it, there's nothing parallel. There's nothing equivalent in the field that I have read. Um, This is not to say that there aren't a lot of intuitively integral people in the field of psycho psychology and psychotherapy who have come up with very cool models of integrative patterns, uh, In psychotherapy, we might call it common factors approaches. So what do all therapeutic sessions have in common to one another? What patterns can we see? So there's been a lot of good work on that level, but none on the level of truly meta-theorizing the specific approaches to uh, psychotherapy and to psychology and to meditation and different types of meditation even. And, you know, I, if there is a a genius on the horizon who will, you know, take it to another level, I'm, I'm waiting for that person. Uh, But I really think Ken, Ken, Ken once said, or said multiple times, he likes to deal with some of the harder problems and that motivates him. And I think his, his connecting different schools of psychology and psychotherapy is one of the harder problems uh, to do clearly. So uh, that's my basic take on just as, as where I'm coming from after 25 years of, you know, contemplating the issue and hearing many alternatives and being exposed to alternatives as well, just through my professional growth, you know, I, have to know about different theories of psychotherapy. So it's not just listening to Ken and taking his word. It's it's a come from a deep dive into the, the field itself. 
Well, I appreciate that it still sounds pretty groundbreaking and leading edge to you. I mm-hmm. think it's, my, my take is that his integration of different psychological schools with spirituality is pretty unparalleled. Yeah. I just got sent by, I don't know if you know Greg Henriquez, but he sent me the first couple chapters of his new book. And it, it doesn't focus as much on the spiritual element, but he's he's wrestling with the problem. He's one of the few other people I've seen do this. Mm-hmm. And his sense is that, you know, people who argue that psychology is not a real science, he's saying they don't make that argument based on the absence of empirical method and research. They make that argument based on a feeling they have that is grounded in the fact that the subject matter of psychology is, is not really clear to a lot of people, right? Mm-hmm. The branches of psychology are branches of what, right? It's much easier in medicine to see what all the schools of medicine have in common. Sure. But when it comes to psychology and all the different types, what do they jointly point toward? In, in your feeling, what is the subject of psychology? What is its common denominator? That's a great question, and I think that's one that I would hope to be able to answer as clearly as I think Ken answers that, which is primarily psychology. Well, first of all, the unfolding layers of development are a reality, whether they are material unfoldments in the sense of physics, chemistry, biology, then uh, psychology of the mind, or whether, you know, Ken is right and there's some slight tug from the universe that unfolds these stages. Nonetheless, most of the thinkers I encounter today agree that this stratification is happening. And so we could call psychology on one hand, this higher layer of mental functioning that gets built upon the biological layer of life functioning. And obviously there are fascinating connections there, particularly as we study other animal species and we look for maybe some of the rudimentary aspects of consciousness and we appear to find them. So some animals can pass the mirror test where they seem to be able to recognize themselves in a mirror. I uh, read a study a couple of uh, days ago about dogs um, being exposed to like unexpected imagery, like a cow barking, and they stare longer at this incongruous sort of pairing than they do if they just see a dog barking. So hence, dogs have some consciousness of what a dog is and they're surprised based on the theory of sort of gazing how long you're going to gaze. They're surprised by things that don't match. So that's a level of biology that might have a level of mind not as well developed as ours. So one way to say it is psychology deals with that layer of mind that is on top of biology. The other way to say it is psychology is that which unfold in enfolds the previous layers. So it's built upon the physics of things and the chemistry of things and the biology, particularly the biology of things. And then you have a mind on top and then you have that sort of Rus- Russian nested doll effect. And so psychology is the enfolding layer of the, the four layers, essentially. Uh, if you want to add spirituality, we could also see spirituality as either the top layer of a new unfoldment, or it could be also the thing that is the, the biggest Russian doll that unfolds all the previous layers. And hence we get not only psychology, but spirituality or soteriology, which is the psychology of freedom, spiritual freedom, essentially. And so I would say either of those two definitions are good. And then what we add to that is that that occurs in four quadrants. So those levels can be seen as those primary perspective or from those 
primary perspectives. So we could see, we can see biology in the individual of the left. We can see biology from a third person perspective in the right hand quadrant, in the systemic quadrant, and in the, the shared sort of what is the biology of shared empathy. So we can take that and split it into the four quadrants. That's where we then get the real extra view because lots of people have come up with biopsychosocial models or they've come up with that basic definition of psychology as a stratified phenomena. But then when you spread it to the four quadrants, and take those perspectives, then you're getting a much broader view of what psychology is. And that turns over into therapy, which is to say that the, the four quadrants has deep implications for what psychotherapy is or could be or should be, which is a method of healing, which is, or helping, which is open to those four perspectives and at any level at which they show up. Yeah, there's an interesting relationship there between psychology and psychotherapy, between uh, trying to appraise it all and the tendency of it to turn into a kind of healing. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, um, you know, you said you've been at this for 20 years and you still feel like the Wilberian model is pretty leading edge. What got you interested in it originally? How did you come to this? Yeah, so I was um, I was probably about well, I was sixteen, and I fell into a relationship that was very tumultuous uh, in terms of kind of breaking up and making up, and that seemed to kick off a depressive process for me that was fairly intense. So I think I was. Uh, I think the, the gun was loaded and this pulled the trigger. And so during my 17th, 18th, 19th years, I was really struggling with depression. And probably the first thing I was willing to do was a very intensive martial arts practice, very strict, very physical, very challenging and the, then the second thing I was willing to do was a meditation practice. I just, my mother had gotten into it and she brought me to one program. And even though it was not easy at all for me to sit, you know, in quiet, I, I had a couple of experiences which made me feel that this was somehow essential, the meditative practice specifically. And then shortly after that, I did enter therapy. So I was resistant to therapy. I was resistant to medications for depression. I can't say why. I think it was really stubbornness, to be honest. But I was dabbling in these things and trying to turn what I would call sort of like a proto-integral life practice of trying to bring things together and because of that, I was wondering about some of the questions you might wonder about, like, there's a guy at my college who stands outside the uh, cafeteria with a placard, you know, basically saying, you, you are going to hell and repent as a Christian, you know, uh, trying to, you know, uh, do some missionary work at the, at the school. And at the same time, I was learning about people like the Dalai Lama, you know, at, who was also saying in different language, you know, there's something called nirvana or, you know, an equivalent. And what do these two people have to do with one another? They seem so different. Uh, and yet some of the concepts that they are using are so similar. So what's the relationship between the two? And I just wondered at the problem for a couple of years. As I got more into meditation, I started reading more. I saw a yoga journal 
article on Ken Wilber. I think I might have skimmed through it and thought it was okay. And then at some point in 1995, or close to 20, walked into a bookstore and saw uh, Ken's book, Sex, Ecology, Spirituality, big shiny paper, uh, big shiny hardcover at that point because it had just come out uh, and it was a hip little bookstore. I read the beginning of it and thought it was really good and then sort of took the dive over the next two weeks, read the whole thing. It was still to this day one a peak experience, at least in my intellectual life. And I left the book feeling like, wow, this is really useful, but I, I don't know how. Um, these categories categorizations and these distinctions you know he he doesn't do a ton of psychotherapy in that book but he does present you know the basic developmental outlines and you can pick up the gist of that even though sex ecology spirituality is covering so many other issues as well but i i felt like this was practical but i don't know how and of course I was 20 at the time, so not a lot of life experience. But that book was actually the, the final motivator to get me into therapy because he, he clearly drew out that meditation wasn't enough and that they were addressing different things, meditation traditions and the psychotherapeutic traditions and so I, I then went into Jungian therapy for two years in a fairly strict fashion once a week. I didn't miss, you know, uh, hardly at all. And so that was what led me to uh, psychotherapy initially and then started the, the track down where I would wonder about, okay, what is integral psychotherapy? How could you use this uh, in, in that particular art slash science? Why isn't meditation enough? It's a really good question. I mean, my sense, so if I were to talk about it in in biological language, my basic speculation is that meditation does not always involve the same structures of the brain that govern things like depression, anxiety, attachment, and so forth, relationships. I wouldn't go so far as to say they never touch those aspects of the brain. Meditation never addresses it, but it doesn't address it in a full on way. And I'm pretty sure having read enough MRI studies, you know, that the, the brain in psychotherapy looks different in its functioning than it does in meditation. And uh, as a spiritual teacher, Kenneth Folk, uh, says you get what you optimize for. In other words, the practice that you optimize for is going to be the realization that you get. So if you're meditating, you know, in mindfulness meditation, you're going to get some of those attainments. You're going to get a different set of attainments, at least on the surface, if you're doing Christian prayer practice. And you're going to get a different set of attainments if you're doing psychotherapy. And so as I have found, but this has been found, you know, very often outside of me, that meditation doesn't fix those issues or address those issues quite so directly. It, it touches them in a, in a certain way. It gives you a kind of, I think meditation gives you a sort of all purpose sense of calm that can be applied to those areas. So it's a helpful synergy, but 
one conversation about, you know, you and your parents is going to light up different parts of your brain that are not going to light up on your meditation or a treat. And so uh, I just see it as a, as a matter of, if you like in, integral brain <laughs> practice, so you're using all parts of your mind and that would be true with intellectual practice as well. Uh, reading, contemplation, writing, these are going to en uh, enact and light up different aspects of your brain than meditation or psychotherapy will. And hence, you know, the more you do more different kinds of practices, the more well-rounded you will be. That makes me think, well, the idea of getting what you optimize for and also your reference to the Dalai Lama makes me think of time that I spent in a Buddhist community years ago. And they were very focused on something they called Buddhist psychology, which was a cultivation of the states you want to be in. And they were very suspicious of a kind of Freudian psychology where these energies and structures are in you and you have to recognize and express them in order to deal with them. They thought that was just practicing those things. Mm. So like, but they're both very compelling models of the psyche. So how do you personally like relate the, the attempt to unearth things versus the idea that the brain is basically practicing to be the, in the states that it wants to be in? Yes. So one way to see that, so one way to say, well, how do we integrate or how, how are we being integral? One of those issues is a temporal issue, basically. And I don't hear people talk about this very much, but it seems quite clear to me that integral would involve the taking seriously the past, present, and the future. And if you listen to different modalities, be they meditative or psychotherapeutic, very often they have a temporal focus and that a lot of their bias is actually on the temporal fo focus. So they're constraining their theory because all we want is the present moment or another psychotherapy uh, would say we want we want to unearth the past and you know heal that so it's a past focus. Another you know more um, perhaps a more transpersonal school would say you have all these spiritual potentials that haven't been unfolded, so let's unfold those. So it's a bit of a future focus. So I would say that we have to look at the temporal dimension as a as something that we want to make cohesive. And so the psychodynamic schools, Freudian, Jungian, Neo-Freudian object relations, all those terms are often having a focus on the past uh, and on aspects of personality or feeling or reaction that were laid down in early childhood. And the theory is if you make those conscious, then you can eventually see them as objects and then make free choices around them rather than unconscious or compelled choices. That theory of how to deal with the past is not, in my experience, how the spiritual traditions view the past, they tend to view, view the past as uh, what they might call uh, samskaras or uh, uh, vasanas, I think is another word that's used, which is to say they're sort of stains on the pristine, pure mind. And that to the extent that we experience the past, it's only to make an object to transcend rather than to make an object which is going to inform our life choices and going to interact with our day-to-day -day psychology. And this may boil down to the fact that, you know, meditative traditions are largely 
aiming for these transcendent uh, state stages and capacities and so forth, they, they don't have as much purchase on what is it like to be a mature human being in the world, putting aside, you know, all, all of the enlightenment stuff. And so they're asking two different questions. I think the, you know, Freudians in the past have been very suspicious of Buddhism, you know, and a sort of worried about uh, a, a false transcendent goal. Um, and so the suspicion has gone both ways. My sense is that the people now recognize you need to do both, though that they aren't, they're not necessarily as clear as Wilbur as, as to why and how and where the synergy really is or the, 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 it, the integration really is. I'm not sure Wilbur's model has made it quite out to the mainstream in that way. Or maybe people are reading it and not always talking the jargon <laughs> of integral. <laughs> Earlier, you mentioned a little bit about the four quadrants. And so one of the nice things about an integral approach is in both diagnosing people and proposing therapies, subjective and material and shared and systemic dimensions have to be taken into account. Uh, one of the other things that comes into the integral model is this notion of stages. And this seems to be uh, part and parcel of the early insights that Wilbur had, that there were these phases and they were separated by these developmental fulcrums and that each one of these transitions required a different style of therapy. So what, what's your sense now about what those basic phases are, you know, looking at your experience and all the psychological literature, and also what's your sense of how those developmental transitions occur? What is, what's the nature of a fulcrum? A great question. Um, I think, you know, Wilbur's general picture of development has been very good. I think certain developmentalists uh, like a Robert Keegan or a Suzanne Kreuter or a Terry O'Fallon have a little more granularity in how they present. Uh, I've even heard Ken say, well, what can you do with like an 11 stage model? It's too many stages. But I would say if you're a psychotherapist, it's not too many stages you know, your job is to be trying to make fine distinctions and, and trying to match what you do with the client uh, with where they are. Now, there's some disagreement in integral circles. You know, I know Andre Marquis, who's an integral psychotherapist of the first generation and a friend, he, he doesn't feel that stages are quite so important think states are more important. It's a very interesting dialogue to have there, I think. And he has a, quite a lot of good to offer. Um, I would say that I think of stages, and I use this analogy in my book, as like a, an actual stage on which a performer performs. So if we could imagine a, a very small coffee shop with just a tiny stage, maybe you're going to get a guy with a guitar up there. And that's about the complexity of what that stage is going to hold. Now, if we sort of imagine more and more complex stages all the way up to maybe like a Broadway stage, which has like an orchestra pit, and has all kinds of lightings and uh, levers and, and maybe even like drop shoots where people can come up. The complexity of the performance that you can place on that stage is much higher. And the tricky part is getting people to see the stage 
because what they naturally do is they naturally focus on the performer. So we focus there. That's where the bright lights are. But if we're really thinking like a director of a production, we are recognizing that that performer, or those performers are s- set in a stage which allows for certain levels of complexity in the makeup or organization of the performance. So when someone comes and talks about depression, sometimes the consciousness they have around this depression is very simple. Uh, They feel down, they do not know why, they're not sure why this started, they're not sure what makes it end, They, they have trouble reflecting on the past, and, and drawing a narrative. And so that would be the same performance depression, but on a different level of sim- simple stage. As people come in and they mature more, now they have have a depression, but they're more aware of the thoughts that go with it. The depression has more of a history that they can tie together. Maybe they're a, a, a can make connections to subtle aspects of the past that might influence their depression. They can start to imagine different futures, even if they're stuck. And so that would be like a middle level of complexity in terms of stage. And the dialogue in the therapy room is very different between that person and the first person. We have more to offer. The concepts are more well laid out. Uh, There's often more behavioral steps they can even take because they have a little more agency in their choice making. Um, And then you might get somebody who is even that much more complicated. They've had a spiritual practice. They've been in long relationships. They've, uh, you know, lived a lot of life and yet they're still undergoing periodic depressions. Often their reasons are more existential and uh, they know to a certain extent what works for them. They have that experience, but maybe there are these subtle elements that they're missing, but it's not obvious. You can't just read them the playbook of dealing with depression because they'll go, I've tried that, I've done that. I know that that works. And so you really have to uh, settle in your psychotherapist seat and listen very, very closely for what might make minor tweaks. So I would say basically a fulcrum is a level of psychological complexity and each fulcrum introduces more and newer levels. It's not the only thing that's important to know in therapy by a long shot. There's many skills you need to have, but having that sense of a person's complexity, it just allows you to sit back in your chair and not be very surprised, I guess I would say, in the sense that probably you're not going to hear too many ideas that make you know make you sit back and go whoa this person knows way more than i thought they did you're gonna be able to sit there and while not predicting every little nook and cranny the basic structure of the person is going to be familiar particularly if it's a stage you've passed through <laughs> as you're as a therapist then you're going to recognize those those notes. And the more relaxed you can be in therapy, the better. So the more you know that settles you in your chair, the better. So knowing stages and having expectations that are reliable settles you in your seat, lets you pick up things you might miss uh, otherwise. There's, There's an interesting tension there between the therapist who's gone through the stages or let's say more stages than the client and the therapist who maybe hasn't, but is informed by, you know, a system which tells them those stages exist. I, 
You know, uh, when I was younger, I tried out a bunch of different therapies. I wasn't, I didn't feel very strongly that I needed them, but I was really interested in the process and really interested in myself. And very often there was a conflict between how the therapist wanted to talk with me and how I nuanced the categories of what was going on. And yeah. you know, sometimes it might've been my reluctance and sometimes it might've been their inability to nuance the topics the way I was nuancing them. Yeah. Yeah. Right? So I always would wonder if some of them were just like really useful for making some basic change in me, or if there was a dimension of it that I was never going to get to unless that therapist was at or above where I was. <laughs> yeah. So this is a really interesting topic. A lot depends on the therapist's ability to tune into, as they say, where you are at. So I, uh, in my, uh, I guess, late 20s, entered into couples therapy or and tried out a new therapist. And the therapist was sort of a Buddhist, non-dualist. And I was describing the problems in the relationship. And she was saying, well, these are only problems in your mind. So if you just recognize that they're just mental problems, you know, you're, you're free of them. So she basically did a pointing out exercise and <laughs> I had been in the traditions enough where I was like, no, no, let me, let me stop you. Uh, like I really have some relationship issues that I want to talk about. And she sort of doubled down on the pointing out way and I never went back. And it's not to say that she hadn't been through the stage. She was probably, stages ahead of me for sure. So, but she had trouble downshifting and recognizing what I was telling her were my points of distress at, you know, a more typical developmental level, basically. Um, and so to have this developmental empathy and to be able to work within that is a skill set um, on one hand that uh, one needs to cultivate if you're going to be a, a broadband psychotherapist, meaning you're going to take on a, a wide range of clients as opposed to just clients who are Vedanta students and, and are working with that sort of one trick, I guess I would say. There's some discussion, you know, Maybe it's good to have a therapist who is very similar to your one, maybe one stage up from you because they're going to be kind of into the things that you're getting into. Uh, so you have more of a bit of a gritty peer to peer. We're both figuring this out therapeutic relationship. And there may be something to that at certain points in life and for certain clients, the developmental resonance of being closer in stage may be important. There's something to that, but there's also something to just your memory, uh, your emotional memory of what something was like and the ability to source that. And then the ability to be at peace with that could be that. This is the person is working on a developmental stage that you passed through 20 years ago, but this is for them the cutting edge. So get the right expectation set. And this was Keegan's point, you know, one of his best points that he ever made. He referenced this famous uh, set of therapeutic sessions, which were on t tape. And it was Albert Ellis, who's a rational emotive therapist. <clears throat> so basically doing CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. And it was Fritz Perls doing Gestalt. And it was um, Carl Rogers doing, you know, his humanistic reflective listening person-centered psychotherapy. And Keegan said what all these people have in common is they're pushing this woman who was in all three videos past her developmental capacity. In Keegan's terms, she was third order 
roughly amber orange and they wanted her to be full orange, bright orange. And they therefore missed her stage of mind in the quest to get her to their, what they wanted. Um, and that was a very influential part of Keegan's book in over our heads and uh, made a big impression on me when I went and watched the videos because it was like, here are these three extremely talented groundbreaking therapists who are not making contact really with this woman where she is. They're, they're pulling her towards something they want. I call that spacewalking. <laughs> like you're going to spacewalk someone out of their atmosphere and you can only do it for a little bit. You can't, the therapy can't be all time, all spacewalking because that's not where the person is. You have to get with them and try to find the right stage. And so that was a big influence and informs still how I think about how I want to show up in the room, which is in, in tune with where the person is as much as possible. I'm hearing the tension between states and development in a lot of your answers. And I think that's a really interesting place for us to go. I have a couple of questions and, and maybe one is around, you know, whether psychotherapy applies in multiple states of consciousness. And then the other one is sort of about what we might call peak experiences. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. Nietzschean and Maslowian sense of peak experiences, evidence that you are psychologically healthy, but it's not exactly clear whether or not peak experiences cause you to become psychologically healthy yes so i think there are two parts to that so uh, andre would say uh and i agree that a lot of psychotherapy is how do we deal with states so we take something like depression and we break it into its state components when is it happening when is it worst when is it the least bothersome uh, anxiety, when is it the highest, when is it the lowest, how do you deal with a panic attack state. So there's a whole bunch of discussion of states in psychotherapy. I'd say the person's stage informs something about how they relate to that state, but a lot of what we do is also state work and tricks to try to change, tricks or tools to try to change states. So for example, if someone is having a panic attack, you know, uh, it would be nice if they could just go into their thoughts and break these panic thoughts up and evaluate them. But the state is so intense that typically that's not gonna work. So the first thing I say to people with panic attacks is, okay, we gotta get your body to do something different whether that's go exercise, whether that's uh, take a 45 minute shower, whether that's have something warm to eat. Some people can sit and meditate during those intense states and it helps, if that helps, great. But we need to get something physical or in very engaging in there to bring the tone of the body down so the state isn't so over, the anxious feeling is not so overwhelming. Then once the body state begins to calm, then we can start to move into cognitive tools, which might be, is this actually a crisis or am I just nervous about public speaking? You know, uh, all of the anxious situations you could imagine am I actually in danger or did I just see a guy who remotely looked like the guy who robbed me? You know, that kind of thing. So we do deal in states a lot in that way, in a very basic way. And <clears throat> most people can use some tools to work with states and you wanna work with people to find that. In terms of peak experiences, that's another kind of state. 
uh, but it's not necessarily something in psychotherapy you work on. It's, I think psychotherapy is a little better for integration mm -hmm. and integration in kind of an old fashioned way, which is to talk about the experience. So I have a lot of folks who do plant medicine, ayahuasca, psilocybin retreats, you know, and they're doing it with a psycho spiritual focus uh, and intention and they reliably come back with big experiences. And, and so I think of it much like if the person had a near death experience, um, my job is not to interpret the symbols of it. Like it were a dream, which is a different type of state work. My job is to say, tell me what happened and allow the person to unfold their own meaning of the peak state. And then I might ask a question, how would you carry this forward in your life? You know, how would, how would you honor the state in your going forward to have that? And that may be that they want to take up a meditation practice or there's a ritual that they want to do because the state had something to do with a, a past loved one, whatever the case may be. I do think peak experiences become very important for development in the longer term. So as you're passing out of orange into green towards teal, in that range, these peak experiences become progressively more important because in some ways, they're going to give you a little glimpse into future possibilities. They're going to open up your thinking and they're going to increase a type of skepticism towards the self, which is, I would say, skepticism towards the conventional self. How, how, do you, how does one step back and take perspective and say, well, maybe my conventional sense of self or ego is not the last line of development. It's usually some peak experience that allows you to glimpse love or compassion or another dimension, you know, that people experience that gets them in a healthy way, skeptical of consensus reality that is delivered through socialization, which is necessary on the way up. But once you have it, ingrained is not something you need to just keep repeating. So I like to see my clients do state inducing work, uh, not always psychedelics, of course, but meditation retreats, psychotherapeutic retreats, where there's more of an, an, an intensive focus. So you can have a psychotherapeutic breakthrough in a five day course that you're not going to get from an hour a week just because of the, the intensity and the repetitiveness of diving again and again into your kind of uh, core self. So, and I think this is part of what integral and slash transpersonal theories have to offer to psychotherapy, one of the most important things. And so it's always an aspect of my work if a person brings it in and eventually if I have a person long enough and they're still struggling, I will then say, okay, I think, you, you know, you need to do some meditation. You need to do something that's going to shake, shake up the system a little bit. And for a lot of people, it's extremely helpful. Of course, small group of people, you, you always have to watch after a recommendation, you know, what, what's happening. Some people, will have a negative experience of meditation. And then you got to think, are there other forms, moving meditation, you know, other things, jogging, gardening, that quiet the mind, but don't exacerbate underlying symptoms, which can sometimes happen. The, the notion of a conventional experience of the self has both a, a personal developmental significance, but also an adaptation to society significance. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Uh, and that's, a, I mean, it's a very famous thing. Freud and Wilhelm Reich sort of argued on this, where Freud thought you were healthy if you were adapted to your society, and Reich thought the society itself was fucked up. Right. Yeah. This comes up in Jordan Peterson, where Jordan Peterson suggests that there's a level of conventional adaptation that is superior to how you initially feel. And a lot of people push back and say, yeah, but the thing you're adapting to is totally fucked up and needs to be changed. <laughs> yeah. What's your take on the relation between uh, conventional and sanity as adaptation to the existing structure or as something independent that has to challenge the existing structure? It's one of the most complicated questions because let's look on the uh, sort of let's let's imagine the a more fast tracked or deeper developmental process. On one hand, uh, you're you're gaining capacity for joy, appreciation awareness of self and often other, um, your capacity for intimacy becomes higher, your capacity for uh, solitude increases, uh, your appreciation of beauty, wonder, all these things, uh, they're not happening 100% of the time, but as you grow, there's all these dignities, we could say, as Wilbur might say, of the developmental path. And it's tough to say to somebody, yeah, you know, maybe you don't want that. Like it's a little, I think it's a little disingenuous if you're a, if you're a lifetime traveler to say like, no, you could skip that trip. It's not so great. On the other hand, developing can pull you away from the social containers that you were in and set you in a more limited circle of people. And so there's can be a type of existential loneliness uh, that's more prevalent. And, you know, your society might become more maddening to you in that you see less complex ways of meaning making being used and abused. And, and so development is not easy. It's often, you know, um, set off by crisis and necessity. So something like, you know, the hero's journey call to adventure, you know, it, you didn't, you're in, in a way you didn't ask for it. It just happens and you might have to go, but it's quite a trial. In the realm of psychotherapy, it's, the question is, can you, can you authentically find the client where they are and where they want to be? So if a person just doesn't have any inkling or desire for what we might call deeper stages of consciousness, I, I will not sell that, you know, water by the side of the river or whatever. Uh, uh, I will stay as close as I can to what the person says they want. If the person is in a constant state of crisis and they're having trouble managing their symptoms over a very long period of time, I might, that's when I more likely to give a nudge and be like, I think you should do some of this stuff, meditation stuff, because they are suffering in their comfort zone, I guess I would say. Then basically other people who are more attuned to deeper levels and wanting it for whatever reason, that's great. I just try to listen to as well to them. And if they're sort of as, as, as we might say, leaning into that, great, I'm going to try to be the wind at their back, uh, basically, and give them encouragement. And sometimes that's very specific tips on meditation. And sometimes that's just, oh, that's great. Yeah, do that retreat. Now I'm excited for you. Tell me what it's like when you 
you know, when you come back and just honoring that dimension of who they are. And sometimes folks like that just want that held. Like they just want somebody to be like, oh yeah, you've got this side of you that's interested in these deeper potentials, but you also are, you know, having trouble at work <laughs> and you want to talk about that and not holding those things in contradiction. Cause in the integral model, there's, there's no contradictions. Uh, those, both of those things are either different quadrants or different levels within the person and so forth. And so I love the freedom of that in the integral way. We, we can deal with anything. And that was, I had a therapist, uh, a fellow named Mokshananda or Joe Sousa, who uh, is known by some as more as a spiritual teacher, but he's a psychotherapist. And when I would be in his office, I could do anything. I mean, I could go anywhere and he would hold it without tension, I would say. So we could have spiritual conversations and we could have, you know, very deep, heavy psychotherapeutic content. And I try to emulate that with my clients and especially my clients who have that uh, kind of high flying developmental drive. I'm curious about the relationship between, you know, a person who's actually able to go anywhere with someone else and a person who's using a method that is so simple that it applies to almost everything, right? A couple of decades ago, a guy built a computer program to simulate a therapist and it was very engaging for people. And really all it did was ask them a follow-up question about whatever they'd previously mentioned. Right. And so what that was really providing was a quality of conversation they felt like they were starving for. But whether it really counts as authentic psychotherapy is a little bit dubious. Right. So, you know, how do you hold that? Like sometimes there's you've got a strategy that allows you to go almost anywhere. On the other hand, there's this rich, lived, complex experience, which allows you to understand everywhere that someone goes. Yeah. You know, reflective listening is if there was one thing that you had the capacity to do as a psychotherapist, that one thing would be reflective listening. So what I heard you say is that, you know, you're worried about, you know, your mother's health, but she seems to be being stubborn about going to the doctor and getting care. I, I understand that that makes sense. So I just reflected what the client just said. Maybe I added a little bit of like icing on top to, to help draw the client out. 95 times out of a hundred, the client is going to say, yeah. And, you know, yeah, that's what's happening. And I'm, I'm, I'm very frustrated too, or the same thing happened with my father or whatever. Bulk, a bulk of a session could just be reflective listening. Does and that mean that as far as you're concerned, the most basic function of therapy could be performed by an AI? Except it's, it's, what change it's almost like so let's imagine the therapy session is 50 minutes which is like a typical therapy session you could do reflective listening for 45 minutes what you can't do or what i don't think you can do is leave that last five minutes and just say okay we're done for today right um because what people want, and they will say this to me. So when a, when a new client comes in, I'll always ask, have you been in therapy? Have you been in counseling? Tell me how it was, you know, cause I want to hear what worked if something worked and I want to hear the complaints. The number one complaint is that therapists don't give enough feedback that they just listen. And that's really about that last five minutes, at least, 
which is to say at that point, you stop the person and you say, okay, so here's what I think is going on or based on what you're telling me. And now I'm going to elaborate meaning in a way that is very unique to you as a person based on what you're telling me. And as I see that, that is the hook of being in a good therapeutic relationship. It doesn't, it's not always the amount of feedback. It's just that there is a person on the other side who's going to step their energy into the room a little bit and engage in a particular way, as opposed to holding back and just holding this spacious questioning. If they could get AI that uh, after reflective listening would feed back some meaningful, astute commentary, you know, we might be out of a job, <laughs> you know, and could, and I could say, could do that successively so that there's a narrative that gets built up over time within therapy. So it's not just nailing it one session, but it's actually then understanding the story of the story and five sessions, 10 sessions, 20 sessions in, if it goes for a long while to, to come back to the important themes, to emphasize the right dimension, to have your client be like, yeah, that makes sense. Or yeah, I could put that into action. So they'd have to invent an AI that had that ability to grow with the client as it were uh, for anything, I think to work over a longer period of time. And at that point, yeah, then it might be, you could have real AI therapy I, I don't know enough about the actual state of AI. You know, some people, I've, I've heard people just scoff at the, that we basically only have sort of a very dumb AI, meaning if you teach it the parameters, it'll win chess, but it's not, it can't quite deal with open problems like my mother is sick and I don't know what to do. But, you know, if they were to get the promised AI, that could the, do the Turing test and, and truly imitate human consciousness, then it's, you know, anything is possible. But it's okay to have tricks. It's okay to have hacks. It's okay to, you know, use those tools. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. A lot of learning to be a therapist is bar borrowing and stealing techniques from people you see who are your therapists or are just doing demonstrations. And, you know, I think in <laughs> much like borrowing a meditation technique, you, you get it wherever you can get it. <laughs> uh, and that's, that's part of the integral way is, uh, you know, no, <laughs> no boundaries. Uh, just don't fake that you, you just don't take credit for inventing it. Um, logical pirates. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. Develop, yeah. Developmental. You touched, um, you touched on Fritz Perls a little while ago. And uh, for me, his book, Ego, Hunger, and Aggression, was one of the most interesting things I read on psychology. And it's also the book that introduced me to the concept of retrojection, of... Uh, mm -hmm you know, experiencing my aggression as fear because I've disowned it, for example. And I think that's one of Wilbur's central arguments about why meditation is itself insufficient mm -hmm. because the thing you might be establishing a conscious relationship to might not be the thing you think it is. And that mm -hmm. might put you further away from it. So what's yeah. your take on, like in a very simple sense, what is shadow and what is the basic approach to handling shadow? Yeah. So I am, I have a, only a basic familiarity with pearls and gestalt. Uh, so it hasn't been part of my uh, real study or journey in this, except in the sense that every once in a while I've ended up in a gestalt exercise because gestalt exercises have, spread, you know, like an empty chair exercise you might do 
in somebody else's office, but I, I wouldn't want to overspeak on uh, anything Pearl's as if I knew. Sure. My contact with Jungianism is quite a bit deeper because I was in Jungian therapy for two years with a strict Jungian. And then my reading has been more of Jung, quite a lot of Campbell, as we talked about in the last interview on the monster's journey. And so, and a, a reasonable amount of neo-Freudianism, what they might call relational psychoanalysis. So they have all have the concept of an unconscious. In terms of shadow, I do not, and this sets me out of the integral community a little bit. <laughs> one, it's one place where I really tend to disagree. I don't love the concept and I'll, I'll tell you why, because the word shadow has a, a nefarious connotation, which I think primes people to think that there are these little gremlins running around that they're not conscious of. And so they go looking for shadow actually in places that the shadow isn't. So they, you know, I don't know, you know, they like to have one too many drinks sometimes. Okay, my shadow is that, you know, I, I've got a drinking thing. And really that's not their problem. If you actually ask them, they're not problem drinking. They like to have a good time. There's nothing about it that's pathological. But the, the, the concept of shadow primes you to look for things that I think often people already know. And then they kind of congratulate themselves for working on their shadow. What I think is the better term is the unconscious. So my Jungian therapist never mentioned the word shadow, but would talk about the unconscious. And when you use that term, you're only primed for what you don't know about yourself. Okay, there are things I don't know about me and where I'm going or me and where I've been. And I have to be open to receiving this information. And of course, yeah, it's good to have a method. So, you know, in Jungian therapy, dream analysis is big. And so that was often the way that I became conscious. I'll tell you a dream I had. So I was, I was quite severe with myself as a personality. And I, my response to being depressed when I was younger was I wanted to become more and more sort of vigilant and, and rigorous in my application of any tool that I could use. So I was going to meditate. I was going to meditate longer. I was going to meditate harder, you know, uh, all these things to, to heal myself. And I had this dream uh, that I was on a military plane. Um, and I can't quite remember who was on the plane with me, but essentially the punchline of the dream was that I recognized shit, I've got to get out of the military. And I jumped out of the plane. And that had two unconscious meanings that I was not aware of. One, I was really in my head uh, and very, very conceptual. And that as kind of unfolded in the analysis was represented by this flying plane that's not touching the ground. So I was out of my, uh, I was out of my body or out of my emotions and in my concepts. And then there's this part, and I remember the feeling in the dream where I felt free. Finally, it was like, ah, oh, I shouldn't. It, it was like recognizing that you needed to leave something, and you sort of knew it all along on some level. But the freedom of I'm jumping this plane and I'm getting out of the military 
corresponded with me consciously starting to be like, you know, Mark, you need to take it easy on yourself. You need to take it easy. This, this punishing driving thing that you're doing is not going to work for what you want it to. So were those things shadow? Yeah, you could probably call them shadow, but to me, it was like I became much more conscious of myself. And it was, I, all I would say is those, those, the fact that I was in my head, I was unconscious of, and the fact, the, the negativity of my driving personality against myself was something that I was really not conscious of but maybe I was ready to be conscious of it. And so ever since then, I've just held a very wide screen yeah. and, and with clients do the same. Sometimes that uh, discussion of like, the gremlins in the shadow is okay and it works, but I use it infrequently. I, I prefer the, the broader term and I'm not so sure who that's really, you know, Jung talked about the shadow specifically, but the European Jungians don't have quite as much focus on that. They do tend to use the unconscious more as a, as a cohesive kind of uh, concept, I guess I would say, uh, you know, could have been, could have been folks like Wilbur and the second generation post young who did it the most, but I'm not against anybody doing it if they feel that it's useful. I just don't, I don't like the constraint of it. Right. The concept of the unconscious is a very large and very general and contains several styles, right? Sometimes we think of like a Daniel Kahneman system one, like a really simplistic form of cognition that isn't really rational and just moves quickly to associations we've made. And we think of that as our instinct. Sometimes it's material that maybe should be in the conscious mind and we've rejected or kicked it sideways. And sometimes there's this sense that the unconscious might contain information about us or the world that is greater than our own information, right? Mm -hmm. Your story about that dream, it seems to me uncertain whether the wisdom arose in your interpretation or whether the wisdom was already present in you unconsciously. What's your take on that? Yeah, I have to say that um, I, you know, this is, would be a segue into dream work, which is really like my favorite intervention of all interventions. If I could I mean, reflective listening is the, the kind of the, the foundation of everything. And I, I, I'm not taking that back. But if there's one sort of intervention that's more sophisticated, it's for me, dream work. And the way I was taught dream work is that it, it presents what you are unconscious of, but ready and so it presents in symbol form or in narrative form something that you you are ready to know. Um, so there is a type of revelation in it if you do dream work, I think, well, um, which is uh, which which requires a certain skill set and training, I think, as well as a type of intuition. But I think I am, I am happy to say that people know things that they're not conscious of. And I don't find that problematic, you know, as a concept. Uh, some concepts seem to have slippery slopes and it, it, you know, I'd say the only problem you would run into is you tell people what they're unconscious of uh, and they're, they're very much not ready for it. It's not primed. So if you're a good student of human behavior and, 
language, you can sometimes see things people are just can't know about themselves and are not ready to know about themselves. And it's not fair to, you know, it's only fair to say, hey, I think there are things you you can learn about yourself, you know, in the future. But if you drop it on them too early, they're not going to be ready to hear it. And it, it may be a whole developmental shift until they're ready. I mean, it's a little bit like, you know, uh, I've, I've heard a million times, you know, you're already awake. <laughs> you don't need to do anything. Uh, you know, you are enlightened, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I, I can feel into that now, but it was use, useless information <laughs> for, for the majority of my spiritual practice because I was not in, I wasn't even on, I was just <laughs> totally non-conscious of any of that. And what was useful was something that would get me to the next step. Like if you could give me a technique or a teaching that would cause me to like perk up and go, oh, okay, yeah, I could do that. That was super helpful. Um, but it was like the lady I went to couples therapy with, you know, when I was 20, 20 something, you know, I was not able to look at my mind as an object like that and, and practice the dissolution of thoughts, <laughs> you know, or whatever she was asking me to do and the where the awareness of awareness. Yeah. I just wasn't capable. So there's, you know, and that's, there's a dance there, you know, how much do you push somebody to their edge, uh, what are the costs, what are the benefits? That is the part of the art of psychotherapy, but it's also part of the art of spiritual teaching or coaching or mentoring. You wanna bring people to their edge, but in a way that's sustainable and is not gonna be too disruptive to, you know, the, the stability of their psyche as, as it is now. Um, this uh, and, yeah. brings me toward a question about multiple intelligences because, you know, uh, Wilbur makes an interesting argument about how the cognitive line leads the other lines, right? That we have these different modules or trajectories or aspects of ourselves, but they're all fundamentally based around our ability to recognize what exists, that you can't have an emotion or a moral response or an aesthetic response to something if you can't register its existence. Although mm -hmm. that registering isn't the same as conscious intellectual observation. A lot of it is subconscious, like we were saying. There may be a, I mean, most of our ability to recognize and work with things may well be unconscious. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, but yeah. nonetheless, that generalized intelligence opens the way for a whole bunch of different stylistic modules of intelligence. And when you're doing therapy, what is that like, right? Is Do you feel like you have to do therapy for a different, uh, like a, a collection of selves that are at different stages of development or, or are they somehow always integrated, uh, you know, into a general personality or how do you treat sub selves? That's my question. Yeah. You know, I have a lot of respect for uh, the concept of parts or sub personalities I've had some very good experiences uh, that have been useful sort of on the couch as a, as a, a therapist client. I do not feel that that is my strong suit. I think personally I'm stronger if I deal with the cohesive personality model. And so I, I, I have the same feeling about somatic work. I've had some really great somatic work done to me. I don't think I have any particular gift for it at all as a therapist. I don't have the, the intuition that some people have about the body and then how to do a somatic process. So I kind of do a type of uh, relational 
psychotherapy that kind is based on more of what where the main parts of the ego are I will name parts for people sometimes, particularly like a younger child part, uh, as opposed to a wise adult part and try to foster a little bit of connection in that way. But I, I kind of stay in my lane at this point because I, I've really come to realize that there are so many interesting ways to work with people that you just, you should give the world your best, <laughs> your best <laughs> shot and, you know, let, let people branch out, which is, you know, if someone comes to therapy with me and they want to go do somatic experiencing or something very somatic and different than talk therapy, like, great, tell me how it is, bring it back in and we'll talk about it or whatever they want to do rather than trying to make myself into the all purpose version, which I just don't think that's where I think it's realistic, to be honest. Um, you know, as, as uh, Keith Witt, integral psychotherapist par excellence says, we have a natural healing style that we uh, probably grow up with. And then as therapists learn to hone and integral is a great playground to sort of place your natural healing style and then become integrally informed about it. But, you know, to lesser and greater degrees, we're non-unitary. Uh, we have inner conflict. I, you know, <laughs> Freud said it and it's still, you know, it's still the, it, it captures so much inner conflict just as a concept. And so if we just draw that out a little bit, yeah, there are different voices in us that are, are uh, having an argument. And very often, you know, we can't settle that argument. Uh, and we need to grow to a place where we can mediate that argument or, or dissolve it or resolve it a couple different concepts in the self. But, you know, I know uh, Jordan Gruber, who's in the integral community, James Fadiman just released a book on multiple selves. So yeah, I'm supportive of it. And I'm a fan of uh, Roberto Asagioli, who was the, really the f father, godfather of subpersonalities. I think he was uh, quite ahead of his time. Is really, really the first integral psychotherapist I think of as, as a Sagioli. You know, one of the things I find myself doing a lot lately is trying to clarify the distinction between healthy and unhealthy pluralism and what has to be integrated and more appreciated from that and what is uh, a, a pathological or false version of that phenomenon, because that's culturally pertinent at the moment. And a lot of people keep asking me about it. So one of the elements that comes into play in terms of whether something is a sophisticated pluralistic postmodern insight, or actually some kind of regression is the notion of triggers and trigger warnings, right? Or mm -hmm. and the broader issue of how we deal with things that are upsetting. And it seems to me that on the one hand, Voluntary exposure to upsetting things is an extraordinary vehicle for growth and expansion and empowerment and resilience. But on the other hand, boundary setting and understanding what we don't need to accept and what we shouldn't be subject to is an equally important form of clarity, self-esteem and development. So how do you juggle voluntary exposure versus boundary setting? Yeah, it's another one of these, you know, probably people would call it pol polarities that is in a, a dynamic flowing tension. And there are some times where absolutely the best way to deal with an anxiety is to face it uh, straight up and get something done. And there are times where your system or somebody's system is 
is overwhelmed and they do need to kind of turtle up a little bit and recover. It's, it's a wisdom question. And, and I'm sure, you know, Roger Walsh's distinction, a knowledge question is something you ask once. Why is the sky blue? And a wisdom question is something you ask over and over again. Is this the thing to confront or should I take a walk away from this because uh, I don't really need the additional stress. And I, I really like the cultivation of those sorts of questions, um, partially because as I alluded to early, it, it's a temporal issue in a lot of cases. The when is the, is the answer um, rather than the what. In the, in the end, you do both. The question is, can you have the wisdom or cultivate the wisdom to know when uh, each of those is appropriate? I mean, as a generalizable uh, statement, there's no doubt that there's a lot of unhealthy oversensitivity within the culture and an overuse of the word trauma without really having a, a clear set of antecedents for what is truly traumatizing. I mean, I've never said to somebody like in my office, well, actually I have said to people in, in so many ways, uh, I wouldn't use the word trauma. I would say that was upsetting to you, you know, uh, cause trauma has a different connotation. And, uh, you know, I hear those stories and, you know, they blow your hair back sometimes. It's so intense what people go through. So I would say, you know, if the culture is leaning in the wrong direction, it's it, it should lean back towards confront your fears, challenge your comfort zone, you know, get out of your comfort zone, you know, and, and grow that way. Because I think we're over we're over tilted towards, you know, safety and softness, et cetera, et cetera. And we need, we need that dynamic balance. And I think that's why a guy like Jordan Peterson, you know, is so resonant with the times because his basic therapeutic disposition is, you know, deal with your life head on, take on responsibility you know, don't shirk kind of like Arjuna, don't throw your bow down at the ground, pick it up and do your duty. And, you know, of course that's partial, but it's that, that voice has gone missing uh, from the culture for a while. And so I think he, he raises it and rightly deserves a lot of credit. You know, that's, I, that's where I'm a, the biggest fan of his work is in his sort of practical psychology, I think is, is quite needed at, a, at the moment and as a counterbalance uh, to, to green, I'll say it that way, um, to, 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 to too much green or un, unchecked green. The notion of, of counterbalancing society or society tipping too far in one direction needing to come back it's a really interesting question because like I do a lot of thinking around what are healthy social structures and social habits and, you know, at different kinds of levels, but what's your take on whether it's valid at all to psychologically diagnose a society? <laughs> yeah, I, I have been everywhere and contradicted myself <laughs> on this question you know, sometimes it seems to make sense. At other times, it it it's too simplistic. Then at other times, I just think uh, it's probably not my best skill set. And sometimes when other people do it, I'm I'm really appreciative that they do. But I think it's because they have a better grasp. You know, we have a you know we have some natural things that we lean to. And I'm very lower left focused if we're talking about a couple or a family 
uh, I can really feel into that kind of those sorts of bonds. But once it gets to a big group, you know, it's harder to track. And I know there are people who do it wonderfully. They can track a 15 people all at once and sense where the room needs to go. And I, I do think it's good to have writers talk about the zeitgeist of the times in a, in a psychological sense. It's always though going to be too general for the individual in a lot of cases. So any generalization, including this generalization <laughs> is going to leave out some details, you know, People would say, for example, you know, there are, you know, the young kids today aren't challenged enough or, um, you know, they're not resilient enough or they're narcissistic, etc. You know, I've got young clients who are not at all narcissistic. They've got plenty of challenge uh, and, you know, they don't fit that larger diagnosis. And if I tried to apply it, I would miss the person, you know, for the trend. But, you know, speaking at a larger level, we got to have some kind of discourse. And I appreciate the pundits who are able to do that with some even handedness. You know, somebody like a John McCorder, somebody like a Andrew Sullivan. Uh, I feel like talks about the culture and I find myself nodding my head because I think they've, they've got their hand on the pulse of important things. Jung did that in a lot of ways. He could speak to that wider lower left thing. I think Peterson does it okay, but yeah, it's it's uh it's it's not an easy thing to do um for sure you uh you know and i appreciated you talking about a kind of um the humility of specialization where the therapist uh, clarifies their own healing style and is able to work on providing that and doesn't necessarily have those same instincts in every other possible area of therapy but I do want to ask something about the, uh, the material aspect of therapy, because there's a, you know, there's some question about whether we focus too much on seemingly psychological phenomenon and not enough on exercise, diet, sleep, you know, taking a brain scan of an individual to see what's going on in that organ or you know, getting out and doing their Wim Hof exercises in the snow or whatever it is. There's a whole set of material phenomenon that might have been undervalued by a lot of the psychological schools. And how, yeah. do, you, how do you weigh the internal external thing? Well, I think this is definitely one place where integral has a ton to say. And I really always hit those notes um, with folks. I always talk about exercise, talk about a diet is a little tricky because there's a lot of, there's just, I, I, I feel like we don't understand diet uh, <laughs> and nobody does. People pretend to understand, you know, carbs and protein and whatever. And I, I'm, and for every study, there's a contradictory study. So, you know, other than like, if you're anxious, watch your caffeine intake, you know, something like that, you know, more or, you know, watch your alcohol intake, substances, those kinds of things. But I really think that's part of a four quadrant approach to treatment. Even if you're going to do depth work, I want to know that my clients, if they're at all, you know, having low mood or anxiety, that they are doing all of everything they can do that is in addition because you need those supports and they're completely legitimate ways. So um, I do a lot of therapeutic encouragement around that. In terms of the balance of what people need, you know, uh, I, I, I don't think, I, I just think any extreme we take is gonna get us in trouble. 
you know, so some people will, you know, say that uh, psychiatry is far over, over sort of medicalized, even though they're a medical profession, but they, they don't do therapy anymore. Uh, they do psychopharmacology and, you know, that's true. And also they're the ones who do psychopharmacology and it's helpful for a lot of people. And also for other people, it's not helpful or it can be damaging. And so ideally, if people are good listeners, they will apply their trade in a way that is judicious and, uh, and responsive. So if someone tells me they're not getting it in, anything out of therapy they've come to sessions and tried some angles and it's not really helping them you know i have i don't tell them you just need to do more uh i'll say okay maybe it's not you know working someone once asked young you know how effective he was with his clients and he said i think i cured one third i think i helped the second third. And I think with the third third, I didn't do anything helpful at all. <laughs> and uh, I don't know what my actual base rate is, but that has always resonated with me. Some portion are really affected by psychotherapy in a very powerful way. Some people get just a piece out of that, that's valuable, but not, not, earth shattering and some people it it sort of uh washes off and doesn't seem to have a big effect part of the art is trying to maximize the first two groups and recognize the third group because either it's not therapy they need or you're not the right therapist to have them have that effect and so i like to make that judgment earlier and more often when I see it. But I think, you know, uh, just the concept that we go to all four quadrants, we do exercise, we talk about work, we talk about family and relationships, every quadrant trying to identify the hot spots as Elliot Ingersoll calls them. Uh, that's a, a a constant process of assessing until we get to all the important issues. Uh, and I think, you know, that's not different from biopsychosocial, but it's more organized because <laughs> I have this little square in my head and you just never miss because the, the, each square has a couple of key inquiries. And if you have that, little map in your mind, you just go and uh, you don't miss things. Hence my love for the four quadrant model. In yeah, it's uh, super convenient. <laughs> uh, super, super uh, convenient. We're coming, we're coming to the end, I think, yeah. but I want to ask one more question about where it can go from here. What does integral psychology need what is it currently not including enough? What is it maybe overemphasize? What is it not good enough at helping with? You know, what's the next step? I think my sense is that the, the culture is going to be, is getting more and more astute or at least aware of the transpersonal aspect of the integral model. And Ken is really the best transpersonal therapist or a theorist, as well as the best integral theorist. So he kind of does both things. And, you know, what did the transpersonalists focus on? They focus on altered states. They focus on psychedelics. They focus on meditation and contemplative prayer. And those were, those are basically the biggies. And then, you know, probably rituals, et cetera, and sh shamanistic stuff that I don't think has totally made it out except for the psychedelic plant medicine aspect, but the mainstream has come and, and they're starting to gobble that all up. 
in the recognition of altered states in the in the research and recognition of psychedelics and the research and recognition of meditation. So something like an integral understanding of states and stages or the Wilbur Combs lattice, et cetera, is ripe for the uh, taking. And I could see that being an aspect of the model that is the most ready for people to get the gist of. Uh, I think the stages part is harder, harder material, little more tricky because we don't want to say somebody's at an earlier stage. It's, you know, it's got a, uh, a judgmental side to it that can, you know, be misused really easily. And, and yet it clarifies so much. Uh, I don't know when that will come online. My sense is it's, it's still, this is all s mostly an educational challenge, which is to say, you know, people in, people are not being educated well today in all kinds of ways. I mean, we're not educating people well, even on a binary of like conservative and liberal, uh, you know, within the university system. So how in God's name are we going to get to an integral? Because we can't even teach people like, you know, we, the, the curriculum is entirely postmodern, more or less. So that sets up a very difficult problem because people have to come to integral on their own. They're not even presented with the conundrums that would might push them up to a both and. Um, and I think the best thing that we can do is keep talking about it. I, you know, I have my integral program where people come to train and, you know, I take as many people as I can. And each one I hope is an influencer in their world and can pass it on uh, what is valuable about integral psychotherapy. I hope all the books get read but I do think there's a pipeline issue and it's gotten maybe somewhat worse in the sense of, and this is a social diagnosis in the sense of the, the polarization is so intense and people have a great deal of difficulty navigating the both ands right now because, it, because the other side seems so demon-like demon that, you know, it's a lot to ask Integral to mediate those disputes and, <laughs> and let's come over the top with the meta theory that's going to help us balance these polarities. It's, it's just a ton to ask. Uh, and that might be one of the things I, if I had been on a, the rebel wisdom discussion about the state of Integral, you know, that's, that's part of our challenge. In terms of practically speaking, I'm not sure what the next, you know, stage of integral psychotherapy is. It already includes so much that it seems to me that if people just used what's out there, in other words, uh, you know, they, they, they read my book or listened to Keith Witt or read Andre's book or, or Elliot's books, whatever, that's a lot. That's already asking people to hold these different schools and different modalities and different perspectives. And I think that's enough of a challenge that we don't need something else. I think, or I fear that people are, are going to reduce everything to the lower right quadrant. That seems to me to be the a little bit of the tension of the times and that's, you know, it squeezes out the focus on other quadrants and, you know, the idea that the personal is political, which has really become a sort of dogma. I, I, you know, I'm glad I didn't grow up that way. I'm glad I was able to meditate 
for many years without thinking, you know, about the system, <laughs> you know, so much was, or my psychotherapy without needing to make it politicized, which it, it you know, it, it now very much is. And you see this in therapeutic circles, you know, where psychological issues are becoming political issues. Uh, that I fear. So I hope at a certain point we balance out that. I thought that was going to be my last question, but some of that's coming up for me in your last answer, as long as you've still got a few minutes. A few minutes, yes. Okay. In the world that we're emerging into, super polarized, super aware of systemic things, but also really... Um, constantly being hacked and manipulated by strategic and algorithmic elements of the digital environment. What are the psychotherapeutic skill sets that you think people need to have more and more in order to handle this situation? Like if, if kids were coming up today and they're coming up on the internet, what do they need in order to be psychologically healthy in that environment? Yeah. First, I think it's a it's a generational sized problem that I wouldn't pretend to know the the answer to in the sense of this is how we deal with the internet and the you know the algorithmic nature of information flow and uh, what AI is going to do or what big tech companies like Twitter or Google or Facebook boy. What I would say is to the extent that you can cultivate sincere self-knowledge, that will act as a ballast against some of this being pulled down uh, either material or ideological rabbit holes. So if you know yourself what it is that you want what it is that you may need, what it is that you care about, want to devote yourselves to, then you're going to have at least some centeredness that's going to keep you from going down cultish rabbit holes. Uh, and so in a funny way, something like therapy becomes more valuable because it stops and focuses on just the person and tries to clarify and get sincere. And I think, you know, that's Wilbur's definition of the truth claim of the upper left is sincerity. And I think that that is, you know, just that line does a lot of work. It's so true. Uh, we can find something like authenticity, something like sincerity in us. And, uh, you know, we're people, we don't change all that much in a core personality sense. So if you can, if you can clarify your authenticity, it's likely to hold you in good stead for a long time. So I, I think, I guess I would say, if you're very confused about what your life is supposed to be, what you want it to be, what people are telling you it should be, et cetera. Therapy is a thing you want to explore along with other self-focused modalities so that you can get some more clarity on yourself and you can therefore have a clearer path forward for yourself. Terrific. Thank you, Mark. I, I always have a nice time talking with you, and I'm always super impressed that you can provide answers to the kind of odd questions I like to ask. <laughs> uh, I, I always, always enjoy uh, your interviewing. Sometimes I feel a little guilty and feel like I should be interviewing you on on the many things that you are expert on that I am not, but it was a total, total pleasure. Look forward to doing it again, uh, perhaps sometime down the road, look forward to your uh, contributions, excited, like I said, for the rebel wisdom to hear you and Bruce be the, be the, uh, what was I, the focus 
and uh, the speakers uh, as opposed to the very gracious way that you <laughs> do the interviews. Um, so back at you.